Anthropology in the School of Foreign Service located in the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. And um, I'd like to welcome you all this evening to the 2014 Karima Khouri Annual Distinguished Lecture. Um, this lecture series is funded by an endowment that was made by Mrs. Karima Khouri to the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies in 1986. And this lecture is the signet event in our annual public affairs program. And I think we all agree that it enlivens and enriches our academic core by allowing us to host and recognize the achievements of our most distinguished colleagues in the Middle East and North African studies. And this year, um, we are very excited and fortunate to host one of the most groundbreaking and engaging scholars in our field, um, Professor Talal Assad, who I will introduce in a moment. But I wanna give a word about Karima Khouri um, who was born and raised and educated in Beirut, Lebanon, one of eight children, and emigrated with five of her siblings to the United States. One brother was an Air Corps pilot who died in action in World War II. Karima never married or had children of her own, but she was extremely generous to all the members of her family and supported one ne Lebanese nephew through his education in the United States. From 1948 to 1967, Karima Khouri worked at the Library of, of Congress and at the CIA as a translator. And I extend a warm CCAS welcome and greetings to the members of her family in attendance tonight and thank them um, for her generosity. So I'd like to introduce now um, Talal Assad, who is, our who is a distinguished professor of anthropology at the City, City University of New York Graduate Center. And we are very honored to have him here for this evening's lecture. Prior to joining CUNY, Dr. Assad taught at the New School University, Johns Hopkins University, University of California, Berkeley, King Saud University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, Ain Shams University in Cairo, and universities in Khartoum, Sudan, and Hull, England. As an anthropologist, um, I have a, have a very fond um, and long history uh, reading uh, Professor Assad's work and uh, initially know his work as a graduate student, which he began as a graduate student in the 1960s in the most traditional of anthropological traditions, that is studying a people in a remote area and his first book um, was on the Kababish Arab tribes in the Sudan. It seems that once he finished his training um, in the tradition, his own scholarly interests brought him to question the basis of such research and to become part of the trend challenging this tradition in anthropology. So instead, Assad and many others are now part of a, of a new post-1970s anthropology in which the object of focus has turned from the so-called native to make clear and be aware of the means by which the ethnographer, or the writer, comes to know the native. That is, in writing about the native, the ethnographer also examines and studies their own background, tools, questions, categories, assumptions, et cetera. Important publications during this uh, period included, include his seminal article titled, quote, Anthropologi Anthropological Texts and Ideological Problems, an Analysis of Abner Cohen on Arab Villages in Israel. And I recommend as an early account as of the influence of politics on how we write as um, our academic work and particularly relevant um, in the environment in which we live today. For much of the last 30 years, his work has been in a different kind of uh, area, and that's been on the phenomenon of religion and secularism as an integral part of modernity, and especially in the religious revival in the Middle East. His intellectual background as a post-colonial theorist and anthropologist among a generation of scholars deeply influenced by and who has significantly furthered the work of such scholars as the French intellectual Michel Foucault and the American-Palestinian scholar of comparative literature, Edward Said. In 1986, CCAS published a short 17-page occasional paper by Dr. Assad called The Idea of an Anthropology of Islam, in which I think now every mass student, every master student in CCAS has now read. Um, and this pa paper, as we discussed last week, critiqued the way that the giants in the anthropological field, among them Clifford Geertz and Ernest Gellner, approached the study of Islam. And Assad proposed instead that a crucial part of studying Islam was to understand it first as a discursive tradition, which he described as, quote, a tradition of Muslim discourse that addresses itself to conceptions of the Islamic past and future, 
with reference to a particular Islamic practice in the present. Unquote. Another way um, that might be said is, to, to, is that we have to know history and religious texts in order to understand how Muslims are Muslims and the debates about, that they are having about being Muslim. And I think it's really hard uh, to, to, or it's impossible to overestimate the influence of this very sort of occasional 17-page paper um, has had on the, on the discipline of anthropology and on religious studies. Um, connected with this uh, interest in, in Islam and anthropology and religious studies are particular links between um, religious and secular notions of pain and cruelty and therefore with the modern discourse of human rights. And two notable books that he's published in the last, uh, in the last decade are On Suicide Bombing, which came out in 2009 from Columbia University Press, and Formations of the Secular, 2003 Stanford University Press. Professor Assad's influence is, is not only felt in the fields of anthropology and religious studies, but far beyond, because he is a scholar whose work explores the ways in which systems of knowledge and systems of discipline interact to produce specific ways of talking about and thereby organizing the world. Please join me in honoring Talal Assad, who will deliver the Karima Khouri Annual Distinguished Lecture this evening. I thank you very much for this kind invitation, all of you, and the introduction particularly. I often get the feeling when introductions of this kind are made that uh, I'm reading my own obituary <laughs> because it's, it's so full of, of uh, unnecessary praise and, and, and uh, so on. But uh, thank you again. I feel deeply honored that you have asked me to, to talk to you tonight. Um, can I put this somewhere so that it doesn't here? Uh, I was really, the, the, the paper that was mentioned, uh, which, I, which was the, the substance of, a, of a, a talk I gave here nearly 30 years ago, um, was what the organizers of this lecture had asked me to revisit. So they said, please, would you revisit this, this talk? So <coughs> that's what I'm going to try and do with, with special reference to the idea of tradition, which I want to explore more here tonight with you. <coughs> now, I should clarify straight away that I use the term tradition in two main senses, which perhaps should have been uh, more uh, systematically uh, distinguished. On the one hand, to signify discursivity, whether written or oral, uh, and on the other hand, embodiment, including not only behavior, but also attitudes and sensibilities. The two are, of course, connected through various temporalities of everyday life. Embodied tradition is a way of changing oneself over time, of acquiring aptitudes and propensities. Tradition doesn't, as sometimes people think, define an entire world, but is a location in and orientation to it. Embodied tradition, as I see it, typically expresses a desire for attachment to and completion of a present that is part of an unfinished time. Embodied tradition has times of beginning, growth, and completion, times of finitude and weakness, times of hope and despair. In discursive tradition, by contrast, humans and objects tend to inhabit what has been called linear time, being moved indefinitely forward. There's been much talk in this context recently about the priority of real experience as against abstract theory. But this, is, this empiricist claim doesn't interest me. The experience that I want to focus on in my exploration of tradition is adjectival, as in the sentence, an experienced mountaineer or an experienced actor, 
or an experienced soldier, and so on. Texts that found discursive traditions are not fixed or exhaustive because other texts or oral traditions that deal with behavior and interpretation become part of those foundations, illuminating or developing them. <coughs> In any living tradition, there are arguments about whether exegetical texts or texts belonging to other traditions are acceptable, and if so, why? These arguments and exchanges indicate that founding texts are moments in ongoing conversations. So in principle, tradition can accommodate growth, rupture, recuperation, reorientation, and splitting. For individuals, there are not only continuities, but also exits and entries. In a critical sense, both discursive and embodied traditions are given, not invented. Even when elaboration or reform takes place, there is an, an, a reference, explicit or implicit, to something already in existence that deserves to be preserved. It's through the various senses of tradition that I want to think about politics in Egypt for my sins during the last few years, especially questions relating to time and authority. I begin by discussing how some followers of Islamic tradition invoke and expound it and note, that, uh, note the antipathy toward that tradition by self-styled secularists. I then argue that the notion of sovereignty in our globalized world makes it extremely difficult for embodied tradition to flourish. Over the last several decades, <clears throat> before the recent coup, whenever I visited Egypt, I often heard criticisms of the so-called Islamic awakening, the as-sahwa. The critics regard themselves as modern, and so signs of what they identify as religion in public offended them. What they found offensive wasn't directly political. Their anxiety was focused on two aspects of what they saw as the danger of religion to politics. On the one hand, the fastidious emphasis on ritual as evidence of blind obedience to authority, and therefore antipathetic to the autonomous modern self. On the other hand, laying claim to the right to display religious belonging publicly posed a risk to national unity, since national politics is, or should be, based on reasoned argument about collective interests. The criticisms my friends had of Islamic tradition echo a historical debate about religion since the early Enlightenment that's partly based on a new psychology that emerged in Europe in early modernity, a psychology focusing on such interior states as sincerity, authenticity, and will, reinforcing a disjunction between mind and body, freedom and authority. Since the 17th century, ritual has been spoken of very much as tradition has. It invokes the past as continuous and unchanging. It consists of formal and repetitive action. It is based on non-rational thought. It reflects submission of the will to authority, and it prioritizes social convention over personal sincerity, freedom of expression, and authenticity. This view was epitomized in the Protestant rejection of Catholic ritualism, eventually to become modern common sense. The assumption that tradition is anti-modern can and has been countered in several ways. Thus, Adam Seligman and his colleagues have recently argued that the formal character ritual has the function of smoothing social life where a rigid adherence to one's actual feelings, that is being sincere, would seriously disturb it. Here, the theoretical object is not individual feeling, but the way that adherence to traditional formalisms serves to manage feeling. The principle of precedent embodied in tradition, is also known to be crucial to modern law. Both common law 
and the principle of stare decisis in the, in the respect accorded in legal reasoning to prior judicial decisions. Furthermore, due attention to the objects, texts, buildings, and landscapes that have survived from the past become valuable evidence in the present for reconstructing that past, and a critical assessment of such evidence is essential to the making of veridical historical narratives. Being faithful to the past is central to the modern discipline of history. So my point is not simply that many, tradi many traditions are compatible with, indeed essential to, modern life, but that secularists who argue strongly against tradition have not thought seriously enough about it. And yet, one may object. None of this surely proves that religion should have a place in modern politics. Some continuity with the past may be necessary because it facilitates social intercourse or because it provides a measure of predictability to the law and therefore to the state. But religious tradition bases itself on unquestionable authority, whereas democratic politics requires public argument capable of being brought to a rational conclusion. Now, I'll return to this and other liberal claims about politics later, but here I want to talk a little about the Islamic concept of tradition so that it might help us to think about the time and authority of politics in Egypt today. In 2009, I was in Cairo for several uh, months and had weekly conversations with the khatib of Sultan Hassan Mosque, Sheikh Osama Sayyid al-Azhari. I was particularly interested in how he understood the Islamic tradition. He talked about the education of good character through the practices of devotion and discipline, but insisted that the ethical formation of the individual as a human being could not be a matter for the individual alone, that it takes place through interactions among people and things in several social locations household, school, mosque, the media, and the street. In each location, there were proper and improper ways of behaving and interacting with others, behavior that had to be learned. It was not simply that practice mattered. It was that learning to practice aptly what had been learned in the past was crucial. What was crucial in traditional devotion was not only initial guidance, therefore, by an authoritative teacher, whether a parent or a sheikh, but its, potent, but its perfectibility. It was in this exercise of the soul, as Ghazali put it, that spiritual orientations and sensibilities could be learned. Thus, repetition of the same, paradoxically, creates a difference, transmuting vice into virtue, and inability into ability. It was a way of acquiring a power as well as a right. It became clear to me from what Sheikh Osama was saying that this embodied tradition was not to be confused with what has been called self-fashioning, a process well known in the ancient world and revived in the European Renaissance. Christian thought and practice had rejected self-making from the beginning and developed an alternative in monastic discipline that taught willing submission. Augustine expressed this reje rejection in a memorable warning. Hands off yourself, he said. Try to build up yourself and you build a ruin. The individual was not sovereign, in other words. It should be stressed, however, that the doctrine of obedience was not unqualified because opposition to false claims of authority was itself an essential form of obedience. The Islamic tradition shares this doctrine with Christianity and has developed it even more vigorously. This should not be surprising because Islam, after all, developed in late antiquity in a world where Byzantine and Sasanian empires ruled and Christian, Judaic, and Mazdaean traditions flourished. And so, as Muslims interacted with non-Muslims, they inherited institutions and ideas 
from that complex history and went on to develop them in diverse but distinctive ways. But with the growth of commercial society, the possibility of self-invention have opened up for much of the population and been justified as the right of the sovereign self. Many critics have pointed out, however, that that form of embodiment is based on the illusion of sovereignty because and to the extent that the individual's behavior is dictated by the market and by the state. According to this critical view, the market is a force that requires consumers and investors to respond obediently, even as the state demands a measure of obedience directly from its subjects. What Sheikh Osama was trying to describe was thus more interesting than what the critics in Cairo I cited earlier complained about. The ritualized behavior was not necessarily the display of belief that inevitably held other beliefs to be unholy error. What he sought to convey was the idea of intention itself being constituted in the repeated, repeated acts of body and mind within a social context. In fact, like the mastery of all grammar, the ability to perform devotions well required not only repetition, but also flexibility in different circumstances. Sheikh Osama insisted that there was a social dimension to the disciplines of devotion, as in the traditional duty of every Muslim to urge what is good and oppose what is reprehensible, amr bil ma'ruf wa nahyan al-munkar, including advice and warning. What I found intriguing about his discourse was the attempt to tie amr bil ma'ruf to the virtue of friendship, that is what he called suhba or ikhwa, to present it as a matter of responsibility and concern for a friend rather than simply of policing. The language and behavior of the one carrying out that duty was integral to Amr bil Ma'ruf. According to Sheikh Usama, a just society was possible only if its individual members learned the virtues through tradition and were helped to do so by relatives, teachers, and friends. Even if you meet a stranger, said Sheikh Usama, you should behave towards him as though he were a friend unless you have good reason not to do so. One could reprove a person kindly, he said, but if urging him to reform failed to produce a positive result, one should boycott him until he changes, because that is a duty of friendship. One implication here, although Sheikh Usama did not articulate it, is of course that speaking or acting harshly may sometimes be necessary to make someone listen. Five years after I met Sheikh Osama, uh, Abdul Munah Muttuh, who was a presidential candidate in 2012, invoked the tradition of Amr bil Ma'ruf in answer to one of my questions about the uprising and the coup and the role of Egyptian religiosity in those events. And I quote, that religiosity is a definite fa a fact. The Egyptian personality includes deep faith and devotion to the sacred and a sense of considerable in interpretation, uh, interpenetration between everyday life and the sacred. But this religiosity is not always accompanied by a social, political, and legal consciousness. And sometimes it is merely formal or superficial or ritual. The importance of religiosity in the 25th January 2011 revolution was that it formed the moral background to the conscience of the revolution, even if its discourse didn't display that clearly. As for the events of 3rd July and later, the powerful propaganda, he said, that preceded 3rd July, joined in distorting and treating with contempt the Islamists in preparation for the events of 3rd July and after. And the matter reached the point of doubting even what is sacred. This was what weakened the values and meanings of fundamental religiosity that forbids the shedding of blood and commands what is right and forbids what is wrong and tyrannical." Unquote. And sorry, I have, should finish a moment. And so millions, he went on, 
so millions of people confirmed and excused and supported ugly behavior that was without historical precedent. So here was what, where superficial religiosity failed because of its, its separation from values and norms. So this is the entire uh, statement that he made. So Abul Futuh's reference to the massacres of pro-Mursi prote protesters by the military regime extends Amr bil Ma'ruf into a political context. But the emphasis here is on stopping wrongful behavior. Whereas Amr bil Ma'ruf can also be seen, I think, as getting someone to learn a virtue, which is a much more complicated process. So let me turn now to the January 2011 uprising and the events that followed and ask how taking a positive view of aspects of tradition might raise interesting questions. To begin with, I think, it should be recognized that the uprising as an event was neither Islamic nor secular. It expressed an aspiration to bring down the system and make a new beginning, to open up a better future that would flow from the beginning. But of course, a beginning never guarantees the hoped for future. Alertness, critique, and imagination are required to respond to the various threats and opportunities opened up in starting a democratic tradition. Paradoxically, the first weakening of the promise of a new beginning in the January uprising was the army's deposition of Mubarak. Most activists were delighted at what they saw as the solidarity of the army with the people. Yid Wahid, as many of you may remember, was the slogan, but which the army generals saw more clearly as a first step in an orderly transition. What many observers missed was that it was not the uprising that undermined state authority, but the weakening of state authority, its inability to inspire awe, that allowed the uprising to explode. And it was the rebels' failure to recognize that fact that gave them, I think, an exaggerated sense of their power to distinguish friends from enemies. When the state's authority crumbled, the Supreme Con Council of the Armed Forces stepped in and slowly rebuilt it. When people talked about a transitional period, therefore, there was some confusion of the time required for realizing the people's will on the one hand with the time required for restoring the sovereign state's majesty and forcefulness, as they talked about it as Haibat al dawla because both times concerned the legitimacy of political rule. Arguments about political legis legitimacy and authority raged in Egypt after the July 2013 coup d'etat, although it was not always clear how those who made the claims and counterclaims saw the relationship of legitimacy to legality. In any case, that theoretical relationship isn't easy to define. Max Weber's famous classification of political authority, that is of legitimate domination, into three ideal types gives only one of them a basis in legality, what he called the rational legal form of domination. The basis of the other two, what he called tradition and charisma, have nothing to do with legality, the latter being a kind of revolutionary, in quotes, legitimacy, that is charisma, and the former an unthinking attachment to the past, as Weber saw it. Carl Schmitt, by contrast, saw legitimate rule, interestingly, in terms not of consent, but of a right to resistance, arguing that the loyalty of national citizens to the state was in effect another name for the fact that the right was not being exercised. His assumption was that the nation state must be homogeneous, sharing a single normative order for political and legal reasons. The right to break the law is not, in other words, derived from positive law, but from the normative order of society that exists prior to the constitution of the state and its laws. 
an order that provides the Constitution its foundation. It is the Schmittian concept of legitimacy, incidentally, that makes it possible for mass street protests against an established government to claim that they are exercising the people's will. But then politics that derives from the principle of a representative sovereign state opens itself to a continuous fear, the fear that the state may be violently undermined by internal elements. That threat makes it rational for the state to extend its systems of security through technologies of surveillance and repression as much as it can, directly or indirectly through private sector enterprises, and to use preemptive force, including torture, to fight enemies in Egypt, as in Israel, and in the United States. And many liberals concerned about the security of life, property, and civilization agree. If the people is the ultimate source of the state's legitimacy, of its sovereignty, where does one locate the government's practical authority? In a representative parliament? In an official bureaucracy? In a constitutional court? Or in popular street protests? Tradition is central to the first three in the sense that they rest on the law's continuity with the past, its authoritative decisions appealing to rules established in the past, as well as in the continuous work of government. The fourth, that is street protests, aim to bring down a government and thus found a new beginning. But it's not obvious that mass protests themselves can be a source of legitimacy, although their threat of violence may lead to a revolution that founds a new political authority and therefore a new tradition. It was Hannah Arendt in her essay on authority who observed that since the French Revolution, a fused concept of authoritative violence has emerged as an expression of the people's will. In the concept and practice of revolution, it was not the use of violence that was new, it was as old as the hills, but its authority in the constitution of a new legitimate order and therefore a new political tradition. What Arendt didn't note, however, is that coup d'etat belongs to the same family of political violence as revolution, but differs from the latter in being a challenge also in the name of the people from within the governing elite, one that aims to change only the rulers of the state not the state system itself. The nature of state violence is the context for understanding the remarks of a well-known journalist, Helmi Namnam, speaking at a meeting shortly after the coup d'etat, in which he refers in positive terms, as many did at the time, to the necessity of violence against pro-Mursi protesters by the security forces. No democracy or society, Namnam argues, has ever advanced without the shedding of blood." Unquote. Now, interesting here is not simply a reference to historical experience, but a claim, I suggest, that coercive violence is essentially secular. Quote, we must get rid of the lie that Egypt is by na natural disposition, Belfitra, a religious state, because Egypt is secular by nature, unquote. Like all coercive power, the violence of the Egyptian state, in this statement I I implies, is worldly. When Islamists attribute a religious essence to Egypt, they must be rejected violently for the sake of the future. The time of political progress, the tradition that articulates it, is at once secular and violent. But why do so many Egyptians then come to hold what may be regarded as a perverse view of their state, according to this uh, position? One answer often given is the ignorance of the masses and the cynical ambition of Islamists. An instance of this might be detected in Carrie Wickham's excellent account 
of the rel rel relatively recent ruralization, as she calls it, of the Muslim Brotherhood and its influence on its leadership, as well as the greater emphasis on ritual, as she puts it, among ordinary members, trends that she connects to the group's increasing conservatism and quietism in relation to what she calls the predatory Mubarak state, because it was published before um, the upheavals of 2011. The rural emphasis on ritual is, of course, a sure sign of the non-modern. But here and elsewhere in her study, Wickham's approach makes explicit what Nam Nam misses, something very important, I think, that it is the interaction of different generations of the Muslim Brotherhood's leadership with non-members and with the state institutions that shapes its various political sensibilities and predispositions over time, that there is no, as it were, essence to them. Be that as it may, the secularist enmity towards the Muslim Brothers has been far less significant politically than the enmity of the state apparatuses towards them because self-styled self secularists had neither mass organizations nor direct access to the repressive instruments of the state. As a relatively small cultured elite from the middle and upper classes, it, is, it was well represented in and by the media. However, whereas the secular hostility towards political Islam was ideological, the regime in control of the state apparatus was essentially concerned with something else. The political danger issuing from the only powerful movement for genuine systematic change in the character of the state. The state therefore saw the Brotherhood as a serious political threat on the one hand, as represented by the professional unions of doctors, lawyers, teachers, engineers, and so on, that were dominated by the Brotherhood, and on the other hand, by the Brotherhood's nationwide organization with its considerable popular following. The eminent jurist Tariq al-Bishri observed that after the uprising of January 2011, he had hoped the state, the secularists, and the Brotherhood would all come together peacefully to establish and consolidate a democratic tradition for Egypt. That this didn't happen was, in his opinion, the fault of all three. But what actually took place, in my opinion, in my opinion wasn't a collective moral failure, but a particular success in the ruthless political game of capturing the state in which the winner used violence to save state authority and time by cutting short the presidential period of rule. As hostility to the Mursi government mounted, the secular activists joined the state apparatus and their business allies who had been working to unseat the elected president from at least November 2012. Certainly, Mursi's enormous incompetence, his inability to reform the security apparatus or to make allies from outside the Brotherhood and his exaggerated sense of presidential power in underestimating also the resources and tactical skills of his enemies greatly advantaged his opponents. The 2013 popular movement that drew on a variety of complaints and fears was ostensibly aimed at the restoration of the January 25th revolution. But what it did was of course, as everybody now knows, is, was to facilitate the coup. Although it was intended to, as it were, carry forward a particular tradition that had begun in 2011. And the coup consisted not in the physical removal of the president, as so many people have, have uh, said, but in getting various social elements to accept Sisi's claim to be above the contending sides, the constitutionally established president on the one hand, and the oppositional parties together with the activists on the other. And in his giving the street protests military protection and requiring what he called the two sides to resolve their disagreement within a specified period of time. In thus positioning himself, the general was enabled by the traditional rhetoric of popular sovereignty to present his unilateral resolution of the crisis, 
as a recognition of the people's will, but a recognition embodied in an act of violence. State sovereignty was restored, even though prior consultation with and material support of powerful countries within the region was necessary to ensure its success. To understand how the past appears in the present, how the past's apparent direction was aborted, one needs, I think, to attend not only to connections between the power of the state and the forms of resistance to it, but also to the micropower that constitutes the predispositions and sensibilities of subject, subjects, whether we call them secular or religious. In his book, published shortly after the January 25th uprising, the poet Yasser Anwar recounts incidents that exemplify secular feelings of unease and repugnance towards the vocabulary of Islamic tradition, including such banal phrases as inshallah. But the main interest of that book, I think, lies in its desire to transcend the political categories used by Marxists, liberals, and Islamists in their polemics. And I quote from him. We have escaped, he writes, from a prison of politics to a prison of old books. No one sees this world with his own eyes, only with the eyes of others. This one is a Marxist, that one is a Wahhabi, and a third is a Sufi. We are all in need of, in need of a translator because we don't share a common language. How can Ibn Taymiyyah debate with Marx? How can Hegel converse with Ibn Arabi? If disagreement is considered a source of culture and, sign, and a sign of its fertility and vitality, cultural despotism and polarized thinking reign supreme over the present scene, he writes. Faced by the dominance of social fragmentation and splintering, the idea of eliminating the other has taken the place of accepting the other, of, of the relationship of neighborliness, of the interweaving of different ideas. All this has disappeared. He writes, unquote. Anwar's complaint that no one sees this world with his own eyes is, of course, in itself problematic because no one can do without knowledge accumulated from the past or experience accumulated from the past to engage with the present. But he's right to draw attention to the significance of attitudes of friendship and hostility in exchanges between people who belong to radically different traditions. Heated debates across radically different traditions, he says, seem endless and fruitless because appropriate sensibilities, what might be called elements of embodied tradition, are lacking. But why is rational debate important to democracy? One answer is that it has a decisive outcome and is therefore the best way of recognizing the truth in politics, as in natural science. In public debate, secularists have typically represented religion as belief that appeals to divine authority, so that when different beliefs invoke different authorities, debates are inclusive, inconclusive, I beg your pardon, inconclusive, passionate, and therefore prone to violence. It's common knowledge that this aspect of secularism emerged in Europe out of the theological polemics and wars, thus helping to form the early modern state that had to administer mutually hostile Christian churches by eventually transforming religio into natio, religion into nation. By contrast, modern Middle Eastern states, as we all know, grew mostly out of the processes of colonial deconstruction and anti-colonial attempts to constitute a nation that deserved a state, therefore. The ruptures in their respective traditions were different. Less well known is the liberal state's dependence on early modern arguments for capitalism, in which the idea of interests increasingly displaced the idea of passions as the principal mode of politics. The good that is calculable, so to okay, economic value, was considered superior in politics 
to the good that isn't, such as religious value, because only the former could be conclusively assessed. This discursive move gave the market its ideological claim to being a neutral mediator for resolving conflicts over value, a claim that has since become central to the secular tradition of the modern liberal state. The electoral process itself has adapted itself in several ways, resource investment, targeting potential voters, gaining and losing seats, and so forth, to the idea, adapting them to the idea and practice of the market. The market has become a, peer, a part of liberal common sense and liberal governance. No pursuit of sectional interests within the sovereign state, no politics. No politics, no free market, no freedom of contract, no paradigm of political liberty. Although the inconclusiveness of public debate about religious belief, so-called, was originally a reason for proposing that it be excluded from the domain of politics and confined to the private sphere, today it seems inconclusiveness is no longer grounds for excluding any debate from politics. Indeed, the inconclusiveness of argument, such as over the manner and degree of state intervention in the economy and of religion, is now regarded as a political virtue, a sign that a liberal democracy is at work, that government decisions can always be reversed legitimately and in time. To return to Anwar's complaint, therefore, the trouble, it seems to me, is not that public views are now mutually unintelligible or that debate is interminable. It's that now the fractious time of dispute and distrust undermines the temporality of learning a tradition. The logic of the market is put forward as an objective answer to this problem. There are several excellent studies of Egypt's acquisition of liberal values since the latter part of the 19th century, interrupted only by its socialist phase under Nasser, and then resumed in the liberal policies of Sadat. These are, however, not simply moments in Egypt's past. They are integral to a contradictory present in which people replay the country's liberal authoritarian traditions. The beginning of state welfare popular education and secularization, but also of the growth of the secret police and the military. Nasser's state reforms of Egyptian society and economy are usually set in opposition to the liberal periods that preceded and succeeded his rule. There are certainly different ways of marking out political times in Egypt, but underlying all of them, I would suggest, is the aspiration of many of its ruling classes to live in a modern time. Thus, it's not always remembered that Nasser's land reforms carried out by state planners benefited farmers who were considered to be efficient and productive, and not the very large populations of poor peasants. That after Nasser's death, the long-standing project of efficiency and productivity helped to promote free enterprise rather than state ownership as the engine of growth and the precondition for national welfare. Whether the state is liberal or despotic or both together, efficient growth is its primary function and thus becomes, a recept uh, becomes receptive to arguments for privatization and marketization in which the consumer can reinvent herself or himself. And it's the continuous dislocation effected by marketization that renders embodied tradition increasingly precarious because market time and the time needed to learn tradition are mutually incompatible. As in other parts of the modern globe, the idea of freedom has merged with the idea of the free market among most of those for whom freedom is a concern and is expressed, for example, in the Supreme Constitutional Court's reforms since Sadat of the bureaucratic laws 
said to be holding back private enterprise. In the period of economic and political liberalization, a plethora of NGOs has created an expanding space of civil society, middle-class activists with institutional funding from Euro-America and entry to Western networks, seek to teach their fellow citizens to claim their rights as free individuals from their state and to produce more efficiently in a free economy. One result has been that this civil society has become further alienated from the predicament of the urban and rural poor. The new market time, with its emphasis on the sovereign consumer, not only undermines much of the continuity of everyday life, but also disrupts the time necessary for democratic deliberation about past, present, and future. Over the last few decades, the increasing circulation of money from rentier income has contributed, as we know, to rapid social mobility that has helped to undermine past sol sol solidarities and commitments and created individualist aspirations and resentment at the failure to realize those aspirations. Several years ago, the prominent Egyptian social critic and political economist, Galal Amin, bewailed what he saw as a change in people's behavior. Promise keeping, he said, pride in one's work and loyalty to old relationships are now rarely valued, so he said. Hisham al-Hamami, advisor to Abdul Munhem Abdul Futtuh, cites an interesting expression to describe what he sees as the growing individualism and self-interest in society, which I'd never heard of before. Gildi wagebi, literally my skin and my pocket. That is, all that matters is what affects my body and my money. The space of genuine friendship, friendship critics say, is disappearing. And with the growth of consumerism, deepening cultural differences and, and life chances grow too. Continuity with the past, essential to friendship, is said to be devalued. When some people speak of growing corruption in Egyptian society, it's the sovereign self they claim to see emerging everywhere. And when others welcome the modernization, albeit uneven, of Egyptian culture, its individual autonomy, economic efficiency, and indifference to religious identi identity that they point to. Hostility to the presence of religion in the public sphere seems to be based in part at least on the idea that it would be reactionary and divisive, that it would rely on the absolute authority of the past rather than on the free individual's capacity for reason. And yet, religion, unsurprisingly, hasn't been excluded from the state. Thus, Azhar has acquired an increasingly public role in the post-coup era, working in close collaboration with the Ministry of Religious Endowments. The present Grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar, Ahmad al tayyib aspires not only to greater prominence in the public domain, but also to greater collaboration with the state in the extended regulation of mosques, preachers, Islamic research centers, some university faculties, etc., and seeks to project an Islam appropriate to the 21st century, as he says. That Islam, more often referred to as moderate and liberal Islam, is clearly one that recognizes itself as being a force in the exercise of sovereign power. An Islam that is appropriate to the 21st century is an instrument of modern sovereignty. So Sheikh Ali Guma, previous Grand Mufti of Egypt, denounces the Muslim Brotherhood as a sectarian minority, as heretics, khawarij, as dogs of hellfire, kilabun nar, and therefore as deserving of slaughter by the military protectors of the nation. I cite this as an example not of violence. All states use violence, although their st styles differ, but of the familiar location of theological discourse within the modern state. Now, in my talk, I've tried to ask why liberals in Egypt seek to exclude religion from political space. The short answer is that a religion that excludes itself from all authority of, of the state 
poses a threat to the sovereign's function of maintaining social order. Religion as such isn't anathema to the secular state. It was after all the reformation of Latin Christianity, first the, uh, first the break of the reformers from the authority of the Catholic Church and eventually their subordination to the authority of newly formed political power that led in time to the formation of the modern state as a disciplinary structure. But there is another connected problem that I think is often overlooked. Many critics have an understandable concern at the attempts to impose an Islamic personality on a country containing diverse traditions and identities. But the crucial question, I think, isn't why an Islamic identity should or shouldn't be imposed on Egypt, but what it is about the modern state that seems to require a homogeneous political identity. The modern state seeks a singular personality for itself in the exercise of sovereignty and claims that this is necessary for the unity and modernization of its subjects. The desire to preserve the unity of the people rests on a political metaphysic that is shared by liberals and Islamists alike, a metaphysic that underpins the modern concept of sovereignty. The belief that there is such a thing as a homogeneous nation, that the nation should be represented by a state, and that the state must therefore reflect the nation's singular personality. This idea, together with that of political minorities and the problems that that leads to, becomes important only with the arrival of modern no uh, sovereign statehood. There are other kinds of problems in other pre-state, of course, uh, uh, conditions, but, but that's not what I'm talking about. One may recall here a controversial remark w Michel Foucault once made in relation to the Iranian revolution. I quote, concerning the expression Islamic government, he writes, why cast immediate suspicion on the adjective Islamic? The word government suffices in itself to awaken vigilance." Unquote. Critics of Foucault have taken such statements as evidence of his romance with political Islam, but they are mistaken, in my view. He's posing a question about the modern state's practice of sovereignty. For the modern state is held together by technologies of power and instrumental knowledge, not by moral ideals and contractual agreement. For Foucault, the genealogy of the modern state is to be found not in legal constitutional histories, but in the evolution of the concept and practice of politics as an autonomous apparatus of control over the life of an entire society. To the extent that sustained unity has any coherent, coherent sense, it comes from embodied traditions, from the shared past and pra present practices that define the life of those who belong to a community, a real community. The modern sovereign territorial state can't have the unity of a tradition because the lives of people within it are too disparate in the things they value to form a community. It's precisely because of this diversity that democracy presents itself as an assemblage of political and legal devices for addressing the ineradicable presence of difference, disagreement, and even mutual antipathy in the modern state with minimum disadvantage, and why the skills and sensibilities required to engage democratically must be acquired by the experience of tradition. So instead of responding to the question, a secular or a religious state, one might try, and I'm ending here more or less, to imagine what politics not fo focused on the sovereign territorial state might look like. If one did so, one would need to draw on older ideas that have been pushed out of the narrative of secular progress since pre-modern times such as the absence of rigid territorial boundaries. The primary question is how far rights and duties attaching to civil status can be negotiated, just as they now are in international law 
But whereas the latter regulates relations among sovereign states, one might have a plurality of groupings, each with its institutional order and purpose, but often overlapping in membership and or territory. Some authorities would be subsidiary to others for narrowly defi defined purposes, but none with the comprehensiveness and finality claimed by the sovereign territorial state. Among these authorities would be a variety of traditions defined not by bounded territory, but embedded in networks of commercial, cultural, spiritual, and intellectual relations, extending be, uh, unevenly beyond borders, an arrangement that some have called a commonwealth. One could belong to a people, an ummah, for example, without thinking that it must therefore complete itself by having its own territorial state. In other words, the functions now performed by what is called the state could be distributed among numerous groupings, none with absolute authority over any territory or being a representative, a representative of any single people. The idea of, nu of numerous non-hierarchical domains of normativity opens up the possibility of a very different kind of politics and policies that would always have to address numerous interlinked bodies. Democratic procedures to deal with differences and disagreements would include civil pressure directed against authorities, including civil disobedience, to make governance accountable. Something like the tradition of Amr bil Ma'ruf, one could argue, could form programs of subject formation as well as incitement to protest against injustice. There would be neither the authority nor the technical ability of state apparatuses to impose a single legal order. It would be impossible to aim at capturing state power or to impose, impose a single identity where there is no state. In sum, if the state sovereignty were to be repl replaced by more complex forms of authority, time, and sense of belonging, neither secularism nor political Islam would have any raison d'etre. Of course, one may point to what one thinks of as a better collective future, but getting there is another matter. Given the world we live in, the mere suggestion that sovereignty be abandoned borders on fantasy. Today, no state accepts the violation of its sovereign rights, although that is precisely what happens to weak states that are unable to do much about it. For in practice, there are rights overriding the principle of sovereignty that powerful states are in a position, position to exercise. Thus, the US and Israel insist on their right to use preemptive violence against another state or against a foreign population on grounds of self-defense, as well as of the duty to intervene by force in another state in order to protect a population against imminent massacre by its own rulers or by sectarian elements whom the state is unwilling or unable to restrain. Sovereign states are invested in the continuous search for global markets, investment capital, and military security, driven by the ever-present desire for increasing profit, consumption, and power under the auspices of international corporations. It's this excess generated by continuous, unstoppable desire that embodied tradition has sought to restrain, even if sometimes it has failed to do so. But in our world, the sovereign individual and the sovereign state, each reflecting the other, neither able to change the world for the better, are both trapped. That's the tragedy, not only of Egypt, but also of our time. I'll try my best, yes, sure. Okay. If you can, if you can answer, I mean, you can take whatever, and I'll, 
we have some time for questions, and so if people would like to ask questions, there's two microphones here. We ask you to use the microphones just so that everyone can hear. So. You don't have to, of course. We can all go and <laughs> to the reception. Oh, the microphone's there, yes. Yes, I, I think oh, I can it is. hear you. Yes. Okay, well, you can hear me anyway. But uh, um, a fantastic talk, and I just want to start by saying that I do share the vision that you laid out of wondering if a stateless uh, sort of arrangement globally would be more possible. Um, and it's actually, for that reason, I was a little surprised at how you ended up casting the role of the market, because as uh, many scholars these days have been discussing, the market is one of the forces that is increasingly dismantling those very borders of nation states that you're talking about, um, having the homogenizing effect uh, of uh, the modern state on the nation and the people. And um, <clears throat> there's been uh, a decent amount of recent work in anthropology on the effects of market and also uh, embodied market practices in um, forming something that might resemble what you're calling embodied tradition. And especially, you focus a lot on the Middle East, but the Muslim societies of Southeast Asia look quite different. And research on things called market Islam, such as like by Patricia Sloan in Malaysia, or mm -hmm. Adarami mm -hmm. or Rudnikij in Indonesia, uh, with some of the factory workers there, or Robert Hefner also in Indonesia, uh, many of those societies are developing what you might call consumer rituals that uh, are developing solidarities within and across state borders. And I wondered if your view of market and marketization that you painted in your lecture has any room for any little bits of optimism in that regard. Well, that, that's like, yeah, optimism is one thing, but I'm just trying to make, um, I'm not very optimistic, but. Uh, <laughs> I think you're, you're, you're right. Of course, globalization, uh, uh, I mean, market has, has a very important effect in, in overcoming uh, various uh, political borders and so on. First of all, let me take that part of your, your comment. But let's not forget that a, an extremely important part of that overcoming of global uh, of, of, uh, uh, borders and, and so on is when it fits with the globalized market. Uh, in fact, of course, international corporations, which uh, enact, if you like, the logic of the market, uh, are very, very insistent on using the myth of uh, the sovereignty of certain states, especially small, weak states, where they can make a, a lot of profit, uh, and use the laws in, 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 you know, which are available to them there. So this is not inconsistent with the fact that uh, you know, nation states nevertheless uh, can uh, form something which is compatible with, um, with the market. Yeah, I think there are different ways, of course, uh, and this is something that I keep thinking about, of the very different ways in which embodiment occurs. And one aspect, I don't know enough about that literature there, and surely, but we know also about it here. Um, I mean, there, there's, there's a certain amount of literature, uh, I'm sure, about uh, the way in which um, the development of the self and embodiment and so on occurs uh, uh, in relation to the things that the market makes available. But that's, it seems to me that one has to get at the difference there with the degree to which this is compatible with the logic of the market. And it's somewhat similar, I think, and I'm not absolutely sure exactly uh, how one would one would relate that. That's why I'm quite fascinated by, uh, you know, the, the remark by Saint Augustine uh, about because this idea of of, of building yourself uh, and of of embodiment isn't new. It's in fact as old as as history, if you like. But there are different ways in which this is done, and if it's done in the way in which, in our world, it has to respond uh, increasingly to uh, the market. Uh, 
then there's something fundamentally different, I think, between that and what I'm trying to talk about as uh, embodied, embodied uh, tradition. Because there you can shift very easily from one kind of embodiment to another. I mean, it's a bit like fashion. Fashion is a very ephemeral thing. Uh, and lots of people, if you like, can be very solidary by having a similar fashion um, and recognize each other as having that fashion. But fashions change very quickly in relation to the market, as we now know. Um, and that's rather different from something else which I think one should get at, where that's not the decisive thing uh, about embodiment and about the solidarities that, that come from that. I mean, not everything, I'm not suggesting, you know, that this is a sort of a golden, golden key to happiness and so on. There isn't one. Uh, it's just that there seems to me to be a fundamental difference which one could explore much more than has been systematically explored. But I think there was a lady who has dis disappeared. Oh, no. your question. Um, you know, one of the difficulties, and I don't, you know, if you have had to do a lecture in 50 minutes on anything which is relatively complex, you realize how difficult, how impossible it is. And, you know, I've been working at this thing, wretched thing, over and over, and taking things out, putting things in, elaborating, and I have, my, my footnotes are almost as long as the paper, not really, but almost. I have very long footnotes, which in a way is unsatisfactory because uh, they ought to be continuous with, with the argument and the exploration. Um, but the short answer is it will be available, um, but it's, it's not, yeah, it's not very satisfactory because it's not, you know, the whole business of a lecture for one hour and somehow we all feel that one hour is the span of our attention, even that's more than we can all bear. Uh, you know, so it's not enough for, for some of the things that are brought up, clearly, and I recognize that. Uh, I hope that it will eventually be, yes, I hope that it will be available eventually. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Did people get nothing? Sorry? Yeah, I mean, they're proposing now to have another lecture from the same university, the same, but they both the same university, but the university is the university of the university. Uh, if we change this to that, we then indicate to the research that we have a change for this uh, lecture to the, the rest of the higher university faculty, which are all mentioned by them in the lecture, of course, it's taking place in a way highly Gosh, uh, this is a very complicated uh, question. Uh, many things uh, have been brought up. Um, <coughs> I'm not sure that what happens, look, uh, and I'm not saying anything original here, that what is happening in various places, including what uh, Qaeda and including uh, Daesh and so on, is really the, the Middle Ages. No, 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 it's quite something quite different. It may be nasty and unpleasant, uh, no question about that, but it's not the same. It's not medieval Europe. I mean, medieval Europe has its own, and so did medieval uh, Islamic society. They have their own uh, unpleasantnesses. Nobody is, is saying that it was all wonderful. Um, but it's not the same. It's fundamentally uh, politically very different, quite apart from it being you know, uh, practically in terms of, of, of mechanisms and, and ideas of, of war and civil war and in relation to the nation and so on. Uh, all this is very different. 
I don't know, I mean, I, I hope that what I'm saying is not intended to trash the experience that occurred in Egypt. In fact, I was there for the four months, you know, uh, February, March, April, May, the whole, right to the end of May. Uh, and I must confess, I was terribly excited uh, myself by it, as, you know, millions of people were. But, uh, and of course, disappointed, but many people are disappointed now. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not just that everybody is, is sheepishly uh, following strong leaders. So many people have recognized how really um, disastrous the situation has become for everybody. Um, you know, I was just reading something a few days ago, um, an article, I think, in Shuruq by Rabab al-Mahdi about the, a kind of, of, of uh, 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 hunger strike by people outside uh, jails in solidarity with, with people inside jails because that's the only thing, as she argues, people felt that the only thing they have left really is their own bodies, so to speak, peacefully uh, to, to protest. And I think that, uh, you know, what people take from that, what the experience is, is not for me to say. It's clearly something that um, people will will develop in time or forget or whatever. But I think the, the idea, I mean, I, I've simply tried to think of also, among, in, in a purely sort of uh, intellectual sense, of the usefulness of thinking of various aspects of tradition in contexts uh, of politics. That is of uh, authority, of the, the idea of a beginning, the idea of a continuity, the idea of an opening up, the idea of, of learning something uh, politically, and so on. All these are things which one could think of together and systematically, which um, I think we need to do. The problems problems of, of, of Egypt, the problems of, of the Arab world, of, of the Middle East, of the world, look, talking about the Middle Ages and so on, you know, Europe isn't, or neither Europe nor the United States is all, you know, wine and roses. We know that, and if we look at it carefully, we see that it isn't. And there are all sorts of terribly frustrating and terribly uh, frightening things developing in these countries as well. So there, there is there is a general sense of, of uh, uh, either of opportunity or of, of despair, but. Uh, I would say, don't let's just focus on, um, you know, the Arab world or the Middle East and the setbacks or, or whatever that, that occur there, uh, it, as as in fact they have occurred. But it's very difficult at the moment to think of think of anything else. I don't know if I'm answering you um, adequately, but um, anyway. Okay. Thank you yeah. for a wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, I th this, this is, this is you know, uh, there's something. I don't know whether you have Trader Joe here. <laughs> Do you? Did, did you? Okay, that's yeah. one, two, one, two. Did you start? They're lines. So but. I was actually, it's a bit of a follow up. Um, and I'm trying to think through your previous writings that we're familiar, I'm familiar with a bit about a certain take about continuity of um, tradition or discursive tradition, and, and then you talk a bit more about embodied tradition today, and I wanted to see how you see the relationship between the two. Um, the, what I'm trying to take away from this is listening to your talk, and I'm also there reflecting on Pakistan and all the mm -hmm. coups, and, and how the question of discursive authority or tradition, uh, discursive authority of tradition, uh, which it might be very intact in an institution like Al-Azhar, is not to be found in most places that have gone through the colonial and the post-colonial rupture in many which ways. Uh, the embodied tradition of Islam as it gets articulated from traditional Sufi order to the kind of incorporation of the market or the in, uh, money funds that are coming in through various different or, you know, institutions and infrastructures of religious authority and others, how that is Counter uh, playing with this kind of 
there is this kind of recourse. Is there a continuity of discursive tradition? How do you see the articulation between the embodied tradition and the discursive tradition, I guess? Yeah. Do you see them as, um, in your previous writing, you have talked about the kind of continuity of tradition, and we cannot <laughs> look at outside of it. In reference to talking about different forms of Islam that you find in terms of Geertsky and reading of Islam as a text. Well, I think there always is a continuity, and it's very important, and discursive tradition is important for embodied tradition. Clearly, uh, the justification, uh, even the ways of teaching uh, what emerges uh, as part of that kind of embodiment is part of a continuity. And I think it's very important to recognize that continuity isn't always just the same. Uh, and I think that that's a mistake that is sometimes made, where one thinks of, of tradition as simply, you know, uh, more of the same. But what's fascinating about it is precisely if you look at various aspects of, of embodied tradition even, that, that there is something which is, which is growing, so to speak, and the idea of something that's growing, whether it's an understanding, whether it's a, a skill, a bodily skill, uh, all these are part of uh, an essential part of tradition. And language which draws on the past and which uses the past and the arguments that may develop out of that, of course, are continuous. I mean, this is something that um, we all know about, certainly in most of the, uh, of the societies with which we are familiar. Uh, tradition I is, is never without argument. Uh, and even, as it were, as I mentioned, obedience to, to tradition or obedience to authority uh, itself raises the question of, uh, well, what kind of authority? And is this a false authority or is this a genuine authority? So in that sense, um, these are questions that need to be more directly addressed. So um, the two are, are interlinked very much, although when they are abstracted, when discursive tradition is abstracted in a purely intellectual sense, of course, it relies much more on um, uh, analysis and, and uh, continuous uh, uh, explanation and, and the use of reason and so on. But um, in the case of embodied tradition, what you have is really, in the end, getting, getting rid of that. And I'm not sure that it's just a matter of Sufi, by the way. Uh, I think that this sharp distinction between Sufi and other Islam, as you know, is, 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 is one that I, I would question. But I, I know what you're, what you're referring to, and I think that you're right. Um, it's really, a, look, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to offer uh, grand answers, but suggesting that there are a whole series of questions we could ask uh, in the study of what is called religion, or the study of, of even of politics. Uh, and we find aspects of what have been dismissed as tradition, as non-reason or unreason or a reason, um, we find elements of that which are essential to it. So I thank you for your question. But I yes. Um, um, is it possible to ask another question? Yes. Last one. Yeah, the last one. Um, I, I know that you've been thinking for a long time about the notion of the human as one of the uh, um, ways of thinking, in fact, about tradition. And I'm wondering whether, uh, uh, to use uh, Sartrean phraseology, um, uh, Sartre said existentialism is a humanism. And I'm wondering whether what you told us today is that liberalism is an essentialism. And I, I'll explain. Um, to the extent that the state, liberalism being the main ideology of the state, is interested in the destruction of tradition, as you explained, um, uh, is it possible to understand that opposition to tradition on the basis of a kind of essentialism that is grounded in the notion that we are born equal, that we are born free? In other words, that the individual that is the subject of, um, of tradition, in this case a discursive <coughs> tradition, namely liberalism, is in fact not malleable, whereas the uh, individual that is uh, the subject of tradition that you describe for us in fact, not just the individual, even the community, is taken to be radically malleable. Virtue is not inherent to the subject, but rather, uh, again, subject individual or collective, mm -hmm. but rather uh, um, 
the, the subject is seen to be in need of being formed. Uh, uh, a perfectibility that is in fact never granted, right? The, fin the finitude of tradition that you pointed to, whereas the state, of course, is absolute and considers as well that its subject is in a way given. You also mentioned that the tradition is the given toward, mm -hmm. toward which one must uh, uh, comport oneself, mm -hmm. whereas the state is the given, uh, ta mm -hmm. takes the world as the given within which the individual is not supposed to be malleable, although it might be fashionable, um, uh, meaning that it can follow fashion and, uh, and look forward to the uh, iPhone 14, for example. But, uh, uh, but that fashionability is radically different from malleability. Mm -hmm. Would that be? Uh, 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 yeah, I think that's true up to a point. Uh, I, mean, I mean, in its essentials, it's true. I would agree with it, if we put it that way. I don't know about true. Um, but whether, first of all, uh, clearly, as we know, I mean, the, the modern state can, of course, also be a non-liberal state as well. So, in, but what's interesting about that is precisely the way in which liberal attitudes, as everybody knows, are so easily shifted or collapse into, I don't know whether you'd call this malleability, but collapse into uh, what might be described in, in, in other terms as uh, illiberal. And there is something, I would, I would say rather that there are fundamental contradictions in the way in which liberalism understands itself and therefore finds itself very easily in a position to defend uh, situations that are just absolutely appalling. Uh, you know, we see this again and again in, 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 in modern times circumstances within the United States, circumstances outside it, uh, as well in, in other countries. And many so-called liberal, um, public liberal intellectuals have been um, remarkably silent, uh, remarkably, if not co-opted, uh, by power in, in various ways. Uh, so it, in a sense, it's, it seems to me it's not so much that it's, it's not malleable, but that it is out of its contradictions, capable of being fragmented into illiberal, what one might call illiberal attitudes and positions, uh, and justifying itself in liberal terms uh, for these attitudes. And of course, it's very much connected with the notion of the nation state, which is the fundamental, you know, in spite of, in spite of all the trashings that, that Karl Schmidt has had for uh, his view of, of the state as well, it was really Hobbes, wasn't it? This is a, a mortal god. Uh, the state is a mortal god. And I think that, that's, that that is fundamental to our understanding as liberals, including the various values that we have. But we'll continue this discussion later. <laughs> Sorry. One, yes. two, here, one. Three. Three quick things. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Karima, Huri, Karima Huri and her family for making all of this possible. Hang on, hang on, hang on one second. Because one of the, there are two other things that are possible. Number one is a reception outside. If you go straight out and then up the very steep stairs, there's a, a lovely reception up there for everyone. So please join us in that. Uh, number two, tomorrow morning at 8.30, all of the students are invited to have their own hour with Professor Talal Assad from 8.30 to 9.30 in the, ICE, in the CCS boardroom, which is inside 241 and then downstairs in this building and uh, three for us having this wonderful uh, speaker, uh, Professor Talal Assad. So thank you all and everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if I'm fast asleep at 8.30, please don't uh, take it uh, personally. <laughs> I mean, I'm fast asleep there yeah. with them. Thank you. We'll get you up. And this is yours. Well, thank you, you so much. No, that's fine. I've just scribbled one or two things in it. So, uh, that's it. Hi. 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 How are you doing? Yusuf, 